I don't have a title for this series, dude. What about Talk All Up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're here with Java. Java's a local artist that I've been working with since... <laughs> I don't know, dude. It's been a minute now, huh? That's kind of crazy. Uh, probably, what, like five-ish years in, at this point? 2017, 18-ish? Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give or take, I want to say like 2017, 2018-ish. Before the world went crazy, but like after high school. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that little sweet medium. All right, so first things first, just I want you to tell the people, tell me a little bit about yourself and like your major musical inspirations. Because like, I actually don't know. I don't think we've ever had this conversation. I know you said in a video recently online. You're probably wondering who my musical inspirations are. Anybody black. May or may not have been satirical. So like, you know, let's just elaborate a little bit. Uh, that's fair, that's fair. Wow, okay, I have like a love-hate relationship with this question. Cause like, my immediate answer is like, you know, everything musical not just black but like you know from like i don't know say queen to like aerosmith to like run dmc and i don't know maybe luke bryan on a weird day no i'm just kidding um but like if i had to like pinpoint the origins it would definitely be like the blog era so like odd future mac miller you know childish gambino wale asap mcjank like all of them um i was because i like i'm a huge kid who loves i'm a huge kid i'm a kid who's huge on the internet and like you know when I was in school, I want to say elementary and such, I was like getting access to the internet unsupervised. And so it's like when you bypass those like, oh, are you 18 plus? You'll see like all these music videos and shit. And I'm like, man, this is a crazy world. So definitely the internet and the blog era for sure. And obviously Michael Jackson, because that's just what the house played. You know, it's like a given. So I actually, this is kind of just a free uh, off the top question because it sort of brought me back to just what my parents raised me on, like you said, with the house played. That for me, that was a lot of classic rock, Mike Jack, obviously. And then like I found hip hop myself through just friends and like like you said, the internet era, I future Mac Miller. When you were growing up listening to music, did you ever, because I was like hyper fixated on like, I, I didn't realize you could just overdub vocals, right? So you could just stack vocal. Like as a kid, I'm just like, how how is that? lead singer singing the background vocals at the same time being like, I'm being like five or six years old. So I was super curious in like the record making process from the jump, but like didn't really go out of my way to figure all that stuff out until like college. Was that something that was constantly on your mind? Kind of like maybe not on a super technical standpoint, but just being like curious as to like what's going on. No, definitely for me, it was like, I always enjoyed writing in like English class, but I'm like trash at grammar. And I want to say it was like, second third grade when like we get introduced to creative writing and i'm like oh poems are cool and like my favorite style of poem are like limericks because limericks just like have a natural bounce it's like so you know i'm like okay but who uses this in like real life and like the thing about growing up is my parents immigrated to america so they're from africa so they're like playing like afro beats and like traditional music and stuff like that but when I go outside and hang out with my friends, you know, we're listening to music we're not supposed to. So my boy's like, yo, I got that new Lil Wayne. And I'm like, go ahead, play it. And like, I can't remember a specific flow, but sometimes I'll listen and I'm like, this is kind of similar to a limerick. And I'm like, yo, I think I can do this. And then I remember Dr. Seuss, <laughs> huge influence, but like he was always rhyming and like my teacher would break it down like one fish, blue fish, two, two. And I'm like, I'm like, yo, this is kind of fun, but I don't get it. And then one day, like, I'm just listening to um, Walk It Out Remix. It was like Andre 3000's verse. That was like when my frontal lobe started to develop. I was like, wait a minute. And like then became my descent into just like music. I'm like, so I'm thinking like, who's Eminem? Who's Lil Wayne? Who are these guys? And it's like, at the time, I didn't really understand what an album was. So I would just go off of singles or things that have music videos, whatever I saw on MTV, heard on the radio, stuff like that. And... It wasn't really until, like, I want to say, like, middle school when my homie was like, yo, like, let me put you on and show you, like, what Spotify is. And streaming starts coming into play. And I'm, like, seeing a lot of these songs that I know. And I'm like, wait, there's more? And the first uh, discography dive I did was Kanye because most of graduation was, like, a lot of singles that I heard often. So I was just like, all right, let me see what this is. And then from there, just 
started to stockpile on itself. Coming uh, more so into the side of like getting into recording yourself and all that stuff. When did that like really start for yourself? And when you first started like actually laying down what you're writing or uh, how you transition into actually, you know, materializing it. So funny enough, this was, if I'm not mistaken, my senior year of high school. So like I was writing raps here and there back in like since the eighth grade but i never really you know laid down a track because i thought at the time the only way to make music was you have to go to a studio and in my head i'm like oh man studios cost like a hundred dollars per hour i can't afford that and i remember i bought a usb microphone and i downloaded audacity and you know I tried making a track and I hated it. <laughs> so for like three years, I didn't touch it. <laughs> and then it wasn't until, like I said, my senior year, we're doing this talent show called Gumbo at Centerville High School. And my boy Tom has his own setup. He has uh, like a Scarlet interface, you know, with the mic. Um, he had Pro Tools and this other program called Cubase that yeah. he just somehow stumbled upon. And he would like put um, like pop filters in his closet, the mic stand and the mic. <laughs> I would have to like record in the dark because <laughs> we would like close the door and like the only shine would come from my phone. But then I'm like, wait, I can do this myself. And so like I started researching how much an audio interface costs, this, that, and the third. And like while I was like learning uh, what to buy and just buying things for like a budget at the time, because I'm like, you know, still in high school, barely making money, I'm going over to Tom's house to record. And that's when he would like teach me small ins and outs. And at the time, Tom wasn't like a world renowned like sound engineer, but he knew enough to like kind of set me on the path. He'd be like, you know, this is kind of what compression does. This is what threshold means, release, attack, sustain. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is deep. And so, like, you know, I'm watching multiple videos on YouTube on like how to make a track sound good until I realize I'm like, good is subjective. So I'm like, okay, how do I make it sound like these guys? And all of that jazz, but it was it was definitely just the talent show that like jump started everything. Okay, so you mentioned YouTube. We're gonna go to YouTube, YouTube University real quick, cause I mean, like me, you, everybody else. I, I feel like anyone that started making music after fucking two thousand nine, you've de or even earlier than that. But like, man, there's a lot of gems on YouTube. So and also a lot of really bad advice. So that being said. What's the single best thing you found on YouTube as far as like when it comes to helping with recording and laying down your own uh, music? And what's the worst, most trash piece of advice that you've al also found? So I'm gonna give us some duality here. The best piece. Well, this one's less like technical and kind of more like inspirational. I was watching um, Kenny Beats live stream and um, he has the saying dots, don't overthink shit. And he was talking about like samples. And one of the biggest things that like stressed me out at the time was like, oh my gosh, if I drop a song with a sample on it, you know, they're gonna be knocking on my door. They're gonna tell me to take this down. They're gonna steal me for all my money. And he's just like, bro, like literally who cares? Cause when you're starting out, you know, it's not that deep. Just drop the song, drop the music, drop the sample, drop the whatever. And if it does become that serious because you blew up, like, you know, it'll all work out and you get the business aspect of things. But for now, just keep creating. And <clears throat> that really just kind of, for some reason, resonated with me. Because, like, at the time, when I'm looking at all these videos, people are trying to make it professional, which they should. But at the same time, I feel like they don't really know their specific demographic because I'm like, you know, I'm a high school kid who doesn't know shit about music business. And they're like, oh, yeah, if uh, you get into a perpetual contract, then you lose all these rights and royalties. And I'm like, I know I need to know these words, but I also know I'm not in a position in the moment to worry about that yet. And so just seeing someone in a position that I at the time wanted to get to or find attainable, like as somebody in the music industry, just going, yeah, just drop the music, you'll be straight. Like, do you know how much music gets uploaded, like, daily? And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Why the fuck would, like, Warner Brothers single me out? So that was definitely the best. Um, the worst. <laughs> There's just so much bad advice riddled. One thing I've started to realize is a trend is they'll take, like, interviews from certain artists, and they'll be like, you know, do this, do that. And, yeah, it's applicable, but, again, you got to know your demographic. 
I'm not gonna say who the specific artist was, but they're like, you know, quality over quantity. And I'm like, okay, true, yeah. And they're like, you know, if you're not getting it mixed by the most professional, this, that, and the third, you're not going to these high-end studios or surrounding yourself with people who are in the industry, then you might as well just make music in your room and like never drop it. And I'm just kind of like, whoa, <laughs> that's crazy. Cause it's like, you know, they're in a position where they have the money and connections and ability to get those high-end things, but it's like, you know, if you're a fan of said person and then they're saying this and you're trying to do your own thing, you're just kind of like, oh, well, I guess I'm trash, and then just never, you know, push on for it because your hero is like, yeah, no, don't do it if you can't afford it. So that was definitely, like, one of those dream killer moments that I'm like, I do not fuck with that. <laughs> I hear you for sure. So I would honestly say I agree with pretty much everything you said, especially because, like, shit, most, a lot of big studios, it's much more than $100 an hour. Like, they, they'll charge by the day, and it's, like, two bands, 2500 three. It, that's also if you're, like, trying to track a full band and all this other stuff. But that's not very affordable to most people. The other thing is, too, for me, I guess, like, from... Um, as someone trying to teach myself how to engineer and produce, it was like, and then after kind of learning from being able to talk to some of my idols after going to Blackbird and all that stuff, I just had a different perspective on the online side of education. And like, a lot of it is great, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of people out there that like, you have to do this. Anything where someone says you have to blank, bad advice. Because it is, like, as we know, it's very subjective and every record is different and it really just comes down to like, what does that record need? So. To, like, I heard someone say, what they say? They said, the only thing peaking over 13.5K in your mix should be your snare. Everything else. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Back up. Why is your snare all the way up there? First of all, that should, that's all mid-range. And, like, yeah, there's a little bit of crack, but at the same time, it, that's a lot of air up there. And so I was just like, stuff like that, where I'm like, and every single song, it has to be like that? No, dude, you got it. Fucking dial it back for a second, cause that is not a, like a hard line rule to follow. Same thing with like always high passing certain things. Like, it really just depends on the scenario, stuff like that. Back to like the sort of recording yourself and getting into all that. I would say for people, especially maybe people that are looking to get into recording themselves, what uh, what was your first recording setup like, and how has it evolved? Um, and the second part of this question is, do you prefer to rec record by yourself and record yourself, or do you prefer to record with like a dedicated engineer so that you can be hands-off on the technical side? <laughs> My original setup, who boy. Uh, so one thing about me is I'm cheap as hell, bro. Like if I could like get the cheapest deal and like meet a bare minimum line, then I'll do it most likely. And so at the time there was this um, company called Rockville and they had like a little bundle where you get like a mic stand, a microphone, um, and like one of those like pop filters that you can like latch on, yeah. the, the one in front of you. And so, you know, I get that set up. I had a Scarlet Interface, the 2i5, whatever, whatever, whatever. Numbers are terrible with me, so don't, <laughs> don't ever ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly, there you go, see. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, you know, I was like, oh man, I gotta soundproof everything. So I was like recording in my mom's master closet and like I was using the clothes to the side and like I would put a towel above. And so like it, it became kind of like a weird sauna for me and my microphone. Cause like, you know, I'm rapping, I'm like, nah, 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 but like I boxed myself in. So it's getting hot and sweaty. It was, it was nasty, bro. Like a song that would take like, you know, two minutes and 20 seconds total runtime and all the takes I had to do over and over, I'd come out like drenched. Like I just came back from like a run and I'm just like, man, there gotta be an easier way to record. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's what I found out. You got those like little pop filters that like you can move and I'm like, this makes it so much easier. Um, What I'm recording with now is an Aston Martin. Don't ask me the specific, because I'm terrible at remembering those. But um, I've upgraded to an Apollo Twin as well. That has definitely been so much more smoother, and like I can actually like hear the clarity and like difference. Because like at first, starting out, if you haven't really been around specific recording hardware or equipment, you know it's very easy to be like, "This is a good mic." But there's so many things that go into it, not just the quote unquote quality of the mic, but also your voice and your tone. How are you projecting on the song, positioning of the microphone, all that. 
And so, you know, when I got the Rockville mic, and I'm like, man, this is so much better than a USB microphone. I'm good. Technically, yeah, I was good. But, like, then I started realizing, you know, you're paying for what you get. And there are definitely better microphones. And, like, the little Rockville bundle I had, and that was a bundle, not even just a microphone, was, like, 200 or so. So, like, yeah, there's a stark jump in the price. But at the same time, there's also a jump in quality that, like, I had to invest in. All right. So, I guess this comes, this is... The B part of that question was would be, do you like recording yourself and being like on your own and being very hands on with like literally punching in and out, pressing record, pressing stop, or do you prefer to be like with a dedicated engineer uh, in the studio or just like even if it's like at your crib, like just having someone else be on that side of things so that you can fully focus on the creative side of things, or do you not really have a preference? Uh, this is this is where it's weird for me because. On one hand, I do prefer working with an engineer, especially like someone who's like very hands on and knows more and can replicate certain things that like I just kind of go off by ear. You know, for example, like on 808s and Heartbreak, kind of like the vocal effect that Kanye would use on his uh, vocals that sounds like it's on a telephone and some old 70s radio. You know, I'm just kind of like clicking random things and messing with slides, and I'm like, okay, sounds close enough, but like. You know, when I sit down with someone, they're like, oh, you know, it's just this on the compression, that with the EQ, and then we're going to bypass this, that, and the third. I'm like, word, word. So I prefer that. But, like, I'm also very, like, prideful, which is one of my downfalls. Because, like, when I'm doing it myself, I'm like, man, I know what I want. I know what I need. In my head, it feels faster. So it's, like, also kind of like a time thing. But realistically, I would definitely always prefer to have an engineer who can, like, just go back and forth with me compared to me just kind of going off by ear and making assumptions over and over and over until something clicks. Um, it's more, not efficient, but faster, I guess, when I do it by myself. But at the same time, that also leaves a lot more room for errors because I'm not really taking my time. and I'm listening to the same thing so many times I go crazy. I was just like, okay, I don't care anymore. Now we're done. And then, you know, it might not have been the best mix it could have been, but I'm stubborn that ego thing that pride thing i used to be really bad about it i've been working on it but like it kind of just being like yeah i understand this stuff and i know how to do the thing but then being humbled in certain situations where you meet like a producer engineer who just has literally as much experience mixing or as twice your age type shit and i'm like all right I got it. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Wait a second. Anyway, so Vance plays us this record he said is unmixed and that he just recorded it the day before. It it just sounded done. Like straight up. He showed us uh there was one EQ in the session on the vocal, just like pushing one K a little bit so that it just you know, is more present in the mid range. But it was it was not so that was a very eye opening thing to me where I'm like thinking like, dude, like his recordings sound the way my mixes sound after I've gotten through like half the chain or more so I'm, all right, I'm either i'm not recording it well enough or i'm doing too much in the mix or it's both and then that kind of like fully that one experience fully reshapes like my approach to how much processing i'm using when i'm using it why i'm using it big emphasis on the why because like especially trying to teach myself at the beginning like you said you don't know exactly what everything's going to sound like so you kind of just push stuff around until it like gets to a point that you're like all right that's close enough, but I also still feel like there's a little bit missing. How do I... I just wanted to know, like, what what am I fucking missing? And what it came down to was understanding, like, honestly, mostly types of compression and where to use them, because there's four, depending on who, who you ask, five different types of compressors. Um, but, like, yeah, and being a self-taught kid up until, like, two years ago, I was like... Well, I don't know the difference between FET and optical compression or VCA compression or all this stuff. And then as I talk to these people, you kind of just experiment and realize, oh, this works here, this doesn't work there. And then go from there. But it's also so much, like, hyper nerdy shit that I don't, like, I, I'm just like, I'm not going to dump it on anyone else. I'm like, if I can, I can help you out, but I'm not, like, I'm not going to go deep into it unless you want me to. Um, okay, so here's, here's a good uh, leading in from the slightly preferring have an engineer on board. What do you, from your perspective as an artist, what are some like telltale signs that a producer or engineer you're working with is uh, on their P's and Q's and really knows their shit and is making things happen versus like a immediate telltale sign that someone is just inexperienced? Um, so for me, definitely is like having a certain vision 
um, when it comes to my tracks. And it's like, this is where it gets heavily subjective. But like, if I want, I'm just making up this scenario, like a certain distortion on the track, right? And they're just kind of not fucking with it. They're just like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this instead. And it's like, it's one thing if you suggest it, but if you're just kind of going to do the little, oh, I'm going to go ahead and do this, and then we'll see how you feel about it, rather than let me know, like, all right, let's try this because, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, you're slowly kind of taking the reins over, and I'm just kind of like, I prefer what I had beforehand, right, if that's the case. But if I don't know the correct terminology, then I just kind of look like a toddler rambling. Like, I'm like, I, I, want, I want the... I wanted to, you know, more than, uh, you know, and like, so then it just, it it looks like I'm not as serious because it's just like, no, dude, because, you know, what I'm doing here is, and then like, they're breaking down like the frequencies, layering, and it's just like, all right, I get that, but how do I get this effect that I don't know how to describe? And so that's when, you know, things get misconstrued and it's, it's one of those passive things because things start kind of, it builds up, right? If we can't get over this first hurdle, that's going to like sit in the back of my mind. Then we run into another hurdle and then it starts stacking up and it's like, I'm not going to blow up and be like, yo, you don't understand, but I'm just going to be like, yeah, I'm probably never going to work with you again. (laughs) Like, oh my goodness. Cause there's just so many things that I get like hyper fixated on. Um, One thing that is a telltale sign that I can like appreciate, even though if it's small, is just kind of like um, essentially trying to pick apart my brain and like, I hate the word vibe, but like try to figure out the vibe of this song, the mood, the direction we're gonna head in. Um, it, it definitely, you know, helps expand my perspective because I'm like, yo, you know, I want a hip hop, boom bap, '90s type beat, right? I'm gonna rap like that, and then it's like, okay, but what if like we were to incorporate ambient sounds that I would usually hear with like indie artists and mix it with this, and I'm like okay, all right, we might be cooking something, you know, because it's like that I haven't thought about before. And it's just like if you're able to see or kind of get a feel for like whether I'm trying to emulate something or create something new, even if you don't exactly understand my goal, if you're just going back and forth with me to try to like get there, then it makes it a lot more comforting because it's like, you know, usually I think a good mix session happens multiple times rather than we're done here. And so if like we can at least lay the groundwork and foundation of like where I'm trying to go with this song, then it's like, you know, we'll sleep on it, sit on it, then come back later and be like, you know, while I was away, I was thinking, and what if we did this? What if we add that? What if we take away this? And so it's just like patience as well. It's like you're willing to be patient with me and then take the time to fully get the image. At least me personally, when I got into all this stuff, I was like, I didn't realize how much of being a producer engineer is actually also a hospitality gig. Like, it really is, and that's, like, it is kind of funny, but it's also very true because, like, for one, if you own the studio, like, you're the host, and, like, you're just having, for better, like, in a very simplified way, you're just having people over to create, and these people tend to have very specific visions for what they want to do, so you have to be gracious and be able to, like, communicate and see what they're going for and how you can contribute if you have good ideas. Offer them, but don't be like, we're going to do this, because, like, it's not it's not your session like you're running the session but they're booking you for that session so um that's a, a line that is very necessary to balance as uh just to have a long career like you said you're probably never going to work with that person again and that like to have a successful career you got to keep getting booked so like you know that should be your uh number one priority for sure if you have anything too that just kind of came to mind feel free to just all right sick. digressing and but like still staying in the same realm of just creation. Um, I don't know if you feel similarly, but like for me, at least, I definitely feel like one quality an artist should have, and not just like recording artists, like sound engineers and producers, I also qualify them as artists as well, because it's like, (laughs) like you're creating something at the end of the day, and it's just like, this is a specific thing that, the goal is to, at least in my head sometimes, be like, this can't be replicated. Like you do this, you're clearly biting, right? Um, and so with that in mind, I'm just like, adaptability is a necessity. Um, and I don't know if a lot of people feel that way. Cause like, I feel like nowadays things are so stylistic, um, mostly due to, I could blame a lot of things, but we'll just say capitalism on the broad aspect. Right. 
you know, under this umbrella of like, oh, you know, we can create competition and stuff. We have like certain trends that people will copy or emulate. And it's like, for me, I know it's cool if you're able to create, you know, the trap sound, the pop sound, the whatever sound. But like, I guess if you had to pick, would you rather be an engineer who kind of struggles with like, I'll say mainstream sounds, but can like adapt better? Or is it like, would you rather be able to like copy 100% well and have it on like a technical aspect? But like when it comes to avant-garde type sounds or whatever, I know I chopped up the pronunciation of that, but like, you know, would you rather be like that perfect copy machine? I can get it down. You want it to sound like this? Boom, I got it. But like when you're on your own, it's just like, if you don't hand it to me, I can't cook. Right. So naturally, like what I would prefer is to be like on the unique side of things and just being like, OK, you guys want to push the boundaries of whatever we're trying to do. Like, yeah, let's go for it. I'm, that's like I think everyone should strive to do that. If you're any sort of creative person, like don't bite like that's fucking lame and it's unoriginal. And it's clear that you're just like doing it for another purpose that is not to create. Right. But at the end of the day, too, like a lot of the business now is like people coming to me and being like, hey, I got this record I want you to mix or produce. Here's references. And at that point, I like, and they're like, this is what I'm inspired by. So I kind of, it's not that I'm trying to copy it, but it is like, here's, it's kind of like Inception. It's just like, here's a sprinkle of thought that like, you can't really get away from that. He's like, well, uh, if I tell you don't think about elephants, what are you thinking about elephants? So it's like, <laughs> You know, like, it's that kind of thing. So, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't really have a choice. It's more so projects to projects. But at the end of the day, like, part of the reason I like working with you and also, like, JVK and also, uh, like, Indigo down in Florida and Map, everyone has their own, like, sort of unique sort of approach to things, which, I mean, is, uh, I would hope so because we're all uh, different people and, like, have different life experiences and shit. So it would be really weird if you didn't. But, like, that has helped me develop as a producer and engineer more than anything because like in the last year i've worked on your project which is rap rap i've worked on mavi's most recent song which was a sort of folky singer songwriter campfire type vibe i've worked on a whole bunch of jvk stuff which is heavy rock um cg's got the the afro beats and the pop stuff uh, and I got in the pop punk stuff and like so in the last year I have worked on more genres than I ever have when I was a blackbird I worked on a bunch of country stuff and it's just like and now that I work at the venues that I work at is I get a different genre every single night and mixing live is a whole different story compared to studio work but at the same time it's like if you like you were saying um, adaptability is key regardless of the situation you're in you're just trying to keep your job trying to stay hired because unless you're like in the one percent of this business like your next gig is not guaranteed. Um, so really just being able to say yes to whatever project comes across your uh, doorstep is is a very key thing to just being successful and um, being able to turn like a love into also your livelihood. Um, the concluding point would just be like a lot of people, um, I feel like a lot of people think that Darwin's th quote was like the survival of the fittest. It's not, it's the survival of the most adaptable. So it's actually a necessary thing in life. It doesn't matter if you're creative. It's just like, if you're in science and tech right now, AI is going crazy and you have to be able to be like, all right, so <laughs> we're going to, we're, we're going to integrate this shit because corporate wants us to. And it's just like, you don't have a choice. So you're going to figure that out or you're going to be out on a job. That's a whole different conversation of people like, well, do we have to work for a living? There's enough resources, whatever. That's a whole different thing. But with this system that we have, and most people don't have the power to change it on their own. It's like, you got to adapt. And like, it's sink or swim at that point. Um, and you will most definitely sink if you can't adapt. Uh, that will also kill your, like, growth and as a creative person. Because, like, dude, I started, so, when I started making beats, it was, like, just trap beats. Because I was, one, learning how to use a DAW. And I was also learning signal flow and, like, what is all this stuff going on? What's a compressor do? What, like, you know, the, all the questions everyone has when they first start out. But I'm thinking, like, uh, at some point, I was like, I am only going to make trap beats and I'm only going to try and get placements with big artists. And then I got one with Juice World before he died. Rest in peace. But then, like, 
it never came out. Yeah, it hasn't come out. It got leaked <laughs> fucking hardcore. But it's cool. I cause that's like something that most people can't say they have, and it's also just like a real. It's a dope song, and that was like one of the f- yeah. That was like one of the first fucking things. But then, like, after that, I was like, all right, well, what's next? And then every, every time I would open FL, I would get bored. I would be like, dude, I've made the same beat, like, how many times now? It's time to branch out. So then I started trying to work with, like, keep the rap stuff, obviously, because it's, like, how it got me into all this stuff. And I'm, like, definitely good at it. But um, trying to, one, just to listen to more music. Not even, like, for a creation sense, just to listen to more stuff because there's so much cool shit out there, like... But then taking what you learn from other genres and then incorporating it back into the trap shit. and Or just taking the trap stuff and putting it into other genres if it works for that certain situation. And then from an engineering perspective, like, because each... How you... What, you, what gear you pick to record will completely change the sound and the vibe of whatever, like, the sonics of our... Uh, that specific record having to work on different genres, like, certain compressors just do not work in, cert- in, like, the same use case as they would in, like, a rock song as they would in a trap song. For example, the CLA-70, th- uh, CLA-3A, so the Waves version of a LA-3A compressor, if you put that on electric guitars, it gives it, like, this crazy, crazy bite that just sounds awesome. That bite characteristic could be applied to a rap vocal potentially and it could help it cut through the mix so i've actually i tried that and i was like oh that actually does a whole lot more than what i was trying to do with four other compressors or whatever it was it's just like i could all that headache that i was going through i could have just like axed like three things in the chain and just tried this thing instead and i got that from a completely different genre on a completely different in an instrument not a vocal and it's just like stuff like that so yeah, adaptability is key. Do you have any closing notes? Anything you want to promote? Any, uh, where can people find you? You know, the, the whole thing. All right, this is where I got to talk my shit for the one time. You know, like them old smack videos. You know what I'm saying? It's your boy Java. J-A-V-A-H in the house. Woo, woo, woo. You can find me on uh, Instagram at R-E-A-L-J-A-V-A-H. That's real Java. Um, most of my, like, socials are that. Don't ask for my Twitter. I don't have one. Um, and currently I'm cooking up anger management. That's about to be out in June. Stay tuned. Cause like I'm going crazy. I can't even describe the sounds of this. Cause like it's all over the place. Takala can vouch. He locked in. So you better stay tapped in as well. That's going to wrap up this episode. I still don't have a name for this shit. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming on the show, bro. We're going to, I'm going to chop this up and get to it.